Welcome, guys. Come on Hi, guys. In. How are you? Hi. How are you doing? We How's were talking about the world Good. record holder for eat, eating the most Big Mac. He just ate his 30,000th Big Mac. So he's feeling he's feeling good. He is. He's, he's actually good. healthier than you think. He, like he should be just be dead, yeah, but he's right. actually okay. Like. Back, he's right there. He's got yeah. bangs and mutton chops. Yeah, it looks like everyone who's ever killed a hooker. He's in. <laughs> uh, he's in uh, Morgan Spurlock's documentary. He's in uh, Super Size Baby. <laughs> oh really? Yeah, yeah. And now he's still doing it. We were just talking about that was twenty five thousand. Now he's at thirty thousand Big Macs. Yeah. Does he have uh, an essential philosophy to back up uh, this eating? You know, I don't remember if he there really was. We think them. it's OCD. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he really enjoys he them. He really likes them. They're yeah. tasty, and he likes them. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty solid tenet as far as I'm concerned. It's probably the if it ain't broke, don't fix it philosophy. Like, yeah. I like this yeah. meal, so I'll just eat that meal. I mean, how many diet fads have come and gone? Who's to say? Right. In 40 that, years? Like, yeah. Maybe yeah. he's just, like, ruthlessly efficient. With money, with time, it's just, he's just, he's crushing something on the side. We don't know what it is, right. but you know what I mean? Maybe yeah. he's just getting it done. Maybe this is, I think it's an OCD thing. I think, oh, yeah, yeah. I you think, think it's, what it is. Is. might yeah. be that. It <laughs> okay. could be that. I'm actually, I've actually spoken to him and his theory is that cryogenic freezing does not work and it's very expensive, <laughs> but the preservatives right. in these right. sandwiches. So he's trying to do it now. Oh, he's he's it's good. By the, by the yeah. time he's done, he I mean, his body's going to be set for Forever. a million years. And yeah. he probably never gets food poisoning because he can't, I mean, if you just eat fast food all the time, because no you know why? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He can't get yeah. food poisoning because he is food poisoning. <laughs> That's, right. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. We have to ask you guys too. Uh, Wild Wild Country was so good. Oh, thank, thank I, you. I mean, it was. He, Sam turned me on to it, and at first it was so interesting. I was like, "Is this really a documentary, or was it he just?" Did, Jim texted me after like the first episode. He's like, "This is fake, right? You guys are yeah. just like," and I'm like, "No, no, 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 no." And I was like, "You have to watch it all." Because by the time you get to the last episode, you don't even remember what was happening in the first yeah, episode. Yeah, yeah. It's gotten so weird. And We're it's a whole interesting how did, group of people. Yeah. How did you come to do that documentary? Because that, that's also not what you set out to do, right? No, no. Mm -hmm. we, we've always loved documentaries. It's actually our favorite thing to consume. Um, but we are also practical people. And we know that if you want to direct documentaries, um, you will be broke and sad. Because it's a very difficult <laughs> yeah. business. It's, it's um, the business of losing money, yeah, guys. So we stay close to narrative filmmaking, which allows us to have children and be somewhat happy. But um, at, you know, as our company has grown, um, we realize that like we actually have a platform now where we can give people money and creative support and control and the infrastructure to do what they want to do. So Wild Wild Country really is the Way Brothers, Chap and Mac Way, who directed that thing, and us sort of being there uncles or, or godparents surrounding them with the protection and cash they needed to make it the way they needed to make it. How so do, what do, they, they, do they come to you and say, like, look at all this incredible footage we have and we have access to 100%, Sheila yeah. and everybody? Yeah, 100%. You know, yeah. 300 hours of archival footage yeah. that they got from Oregon and they had already contacted some of the people and the, and, the, and the package was really good and they had taken it around town and no one wanted to buy it. Really? Which is insane. And then literally it just took, like, us taking our Duplass Brothers stamp and saying, and like, okay, we'll put our name on it. We'll just we'll just pay for this so that you can do it the way you want to do it, and we'll and we'll we'll set you up. And I would like to say that we were the creative geniuses, but it really it's them. right. Yeah. How do, but how do people avoid the trap of when making documentary falling into pushing one side or the other? Because making a murderer was really interesting, but it made me angry because I'm like they're pushing Stephen Avery's yeah, side can, so you much. Can, you can feel the agenda in yeah. there. Yeah, I mean these guys. If you see these guys, they look like. They're they're basically bros in their late twenties. Like they have no business having this level of equanimity or, or respect <laughs> or just like appreciation for somebody like Sheila. I mean, they're really unique, amazing human beings. And like Mark said, we didn't have to like baby them or anything like that. I mean, it was a, also by the way, they had previously made this this documentary called The Battered Bastards of Baseball. Have you guys seen no. this? No, no. It's it, it it's is on a, Netflix. It is a top notch uh Absolutely, it's it's a it's almost like a perfect doc. About what? So, it's it's about a, a little league, uh, not a not little, little league, league, a a uh, triple A is a triple yeah. A baseball team in in Oregon that basically the business of uh uh working with with uh coming up in baseball basically. Yeah, they're kind of this independent triple A team, which is odd and um. They build a team full of like the best 18 year olds and like the 40 year olds who have one year left. So it's almost like the real life major league. And um, they do it just so that they can sell beer and have a business. But then <laughs> they start winning. 
And the major league teams start getting very upset about this and start dropping their A players down to AAA to beat them. And they wow. still keep winning. And it is really incredible. That's interesting. Yeah. It's, it's almost like uh, when it was springtime for Hitler. All that becomes, <laughs> right, it's supposed right, to be right. shitty and it becomes good. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So when you, when you do something like this, does Netflix now come to you and be like, okay, now find us the next one. Now find us the next one. Yeah, we have these great relationships with, with Netflix and uh, who we do a lot of movies uh, with and, and HBO who we do a lot of our, our TV work with. And um, I think we're their bottom feeders essentially. You know, like they, they, uh, they need to go find the next uh, Game of Thrones and the next huge thing and they need to put their attention on that. And they don't have time to find these smaller things, but they sort of trust us as almost a little like sub-label of them yeah. to go go find things that are good and interesting and we make them cheaply and um it's a really beneficial relationship for everybody we basically signed our deal with them when they did their big adam sandler deal and i think they were like hey we're, we're still weird and cool too uh, <laughs> 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 And your book is called, it's just called Like Brothers, and there, you guys are doing a whole big book tour. Uh, we won't mention all the dates, but just say uh, tomorrow you're going to be at the Smithsonian Associates at uh, Hirshhorn Museum in D.C., and uh, Friday at the Alamo Draft House in Austin, Texas. You can pick cool places to do this. And then uh, JCC is San Francisco Saturday, and then uh, the Region Theater May 16th in L.A. So those are all cool places to do a sign. They're kind of unique places, too. Yeah, I mean, we we don't really uh, perceive ourselves as authors. You know, we're we're fil filmmakers who decided to write a book. Um, and I think for us, you know, if there's something special we had to offer, it was really telling people how we came from absolutely nowhere with no connections and we're just desperate enough to keep going uh, to build this system on our own. Um, and then I think that, um, you know, along the way, we sort of, we developed a pretty unique bond as, as brothers um, and a way of, I guess, communicating with each other that was a total absence of ego, a total value on what the two of us could do together by kind of subordinating our individual selves, right? Yeah, which was very helpful, but also now that we're older, realizing like maybe a little unhealthy at times too. Why codependent? Yeah, oh, extremely yeah. codependent. Oh yeah, total yeah. mess. Yeah. There's, there's a great part in the book where you uh, you you go over a concept that you had for a movie, the blowjob thing that you couldn't make, and then you, you tell the short story. And then you put in the emails that went back and forth. Mm -hmm. Are the emails real? Yeah, it's all no, real. Yeah. Tell me, yeah. It's real. yeah. <laughs> it really is an exchange that just goes from like, oh, I really appreciate that feedback to, okay, you just really hurt my feelings yeah. with that. <laughs> just like <laughs> you guys think each other that way. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. mean, it, it's it's it, people think it's strange and they they think we're lying, um, but the way that we argue i guess is just like um it seems like like a couple that has been through like deep relationship that's counseling that's, that's that kind of what like we therapeutic are language we've you know? been doing this since we were kids i think what it really comes down to is like i think we knew from a very early age that we wanted to make art we came from a very sort of like orderly catholic school background in new orleans and we didn't know anybody who was successful in the arts and subconsciously we just knew that like if we were going to make this happen we were going to have to link arms and put everything aside and prioritize our relationship too because you know when you're when you're when you're heading out into the unknown like to do it alone i think we both just felt like it wasn't one going to happen we're going to have to do it together so at what point do you guys realize we don't just want to make films we want to make films with people like take on the producer role like we were just talking about. accidentally it was totally accidental <laughs> we were like the first people in our group of friends to make any money as filmmakers um and then all of our friends were still making their little like ten thousand dollar movies and we were getting a lot of like oh god i'm supposed to film tomorrow and i lost four thousand dollars of my funding and we just have survivor's guilt so we're like here take the money <laughs> and then we did what we normally do we helped them with their watch their rough cuts with their scripts. We helped them get into Sundance. And, and someone looked at us one day and was like, you guys are producers. And we're like, oh. Yeah. I guess that's, <laughs> yeah, that's what I we guess, are. I guess that's what we're yeah, producers. Yeah. I'm going I'm to get a blazer. I'm a producer. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> and Jay, how, we have to ask you, how are you doing with Transparent? I know you guys are shooting the fifth and final seat. How, it's it's got to be an awkward situation. How is it being handled and how do you feel about it? Yeah, I mean, it's. I, I think first and foremost, it's like kind of like dealing with like the disillusion of a family you know because it's been such an incredible experience along the way making this show being part of a civil rights movement and just being really close to everyone in the family so and that not only includes the cast but just like the crew and you know 
I was told recently that Transparent is like the second largest employer of transgender people after like the U.S. military. So it's like really kind of like a special thing. And to have it kind of be being torn apart a bit from the inside out has been tough. Um, I mean, honestly, I just feel so grateful to be a part of it. I mean, I wasn't even an actor before this show. This is such an unusual experience for me. And it's kind of helped me discover that acting is a huge part of what I want to do. I think right now it's just a matter of um, it's on Jill Soloway, the brilliant creator of the show. And, and, you know, what they have to deal with now is how do I finish a show, which is already really hard to do? Uh, how do I make Amazon happy? How do I, you know, honor the transgender community? How do I like honor the legacy of their family? Because this is ultimately a, a show about Jill's family and, and what they went. Her through. father, right? Her dad. Yeah, her father transitioned um, late in life, and and that's what the character of Mora was based on. Um, so, um, so it's pretty easy. Yeah. Pretty <laughs> easy for her to just lock this Smooth puppy sailing. up and yeah, push yeah. it they up. They said that there was like a weird. Uh, Jeffrey did an interview in the uh, in the Hollywood Reporter where he kind of said that they were trying. To, it seems like there was this push because he's not trans to get him out at one point so that might have been the reason they used to get him out or maybe they pushed to get him out what are they doing with with the character are they killing Mara off or how are they getting rid of the character or has that not been decided i don't know i think jill is just diving deep right now i think it you know jeffrey was let go from the show a couple of months ago only so there was an investigation and Jill at the time was developing like two or three potentials as to what this series might be, uh, whether it would be rebooted. Now, it's only pretty recent that we know that this will be the last season and that Jeffrey won't be a part of it. So I think, you know, Jill is just going deep right now trying to figure out how to do it. Yeah, because we've interviewed him twice and the first time was great and the second time we got like a little bit testy and he said he has anger issues. So maybe that went into it too. I don't know. You uh, you have a section in the book where you're defending the sequel to The Karate Kid, mm -hmm. which I think is an important <laughs> thing. I mean, people are talking about The Karate mm -hmm. Kid now. Have you seen Cobra Kai? I have seen the pilot, yes. What did you think of it? Um, I was, um, you know what really struck me? First of all, it was way better than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Um, uh, and I was surprised at how much I enjoyed living in the Karate Kid vibe. They have the vibe. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a totally different show, a totally different tone, but like, I was kind of enjoying being around those guys uh, for, for 30 minutes. It was weird. Is the there's... sensei in it? Is the original sensei in it? He was not in the pilot. Okay. Um, I think his he's name, dead. His oh, name, is he dead? His name I know is Pat Mark dead. Cove. Let's have some respect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know Mr. Miyagi know. passed away. Oh, I thought that's who you were talking about. No, no, no. Um, no. You're no. talking about the Cobra Kai. Cobra Kai sensei. Right. Yes. He has not popped up that I've seen But he's not today. dead, is he? Martin Cove is alive yes, and right well. <laughs> and let's, uh, let's have a moment for Martin Cove, <laughs> guys. Celebrate yeah. him. He's yeah, not just the sensei. Have some respect. I thought there was something like... You know, every time they do these reboots or whatever, I, it was the first time I remember looking at something and being like, these guys peaked in high school. Like, because yeah. they, they, they were awesome yeah. when we all watched The Karate Kid, right? Yeah. But that, that was their peak. And we get to go like, okay, no matter what I've done over the last 25 years, they haven't done any better. It makes me feel, <laughs> makes me feel good, you know? Well, the sequel to The Karate Kid was pretty good. With, um, <laughs> the second one? Don't go back and rewatch it, bro. I mean, when we were kids and we watched it, we loved it. And then you watch it. You don't later. like that dance? <laughs> Come on, the dance was pretty good. With the with the Oh my god. The little, the ding, Mr. Ding, ding, Sato? Ding, ding. But let's, like let, let's 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 just analyze this for a sure. second. Right. The whole premise of the Karate Kid 2 is a little toy that swings back and forth and bonks itself. Sure. The whole premise is you punch left and right enough, and then you will do good in life. That's that right. is the fucking. That is like the. the What's wrong? I don't see anything wrong. With I that. don't either. You I come full force. force. <laughs> you give it all you got. Both sides yeah. equally swinging. It's very yeah. symbolic. It, it Perfect. is an ancient Okinawan secret, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Karate Kid too. Colon bonking left and right. <laughs> <laughs> the guy throws the bridge away. There's no bridge to safety. Yeah. Come on. Uh, very very good on. film. Good that stuff. girl was so cute too, wasn't she? Oh yeah. The girl. I had a you thing know what? You're really turning me around here. You know. <laughs> yeah. I'm really, I'm really feeling. I'm telling you, the fucking little girl stuck up in a tree. The guy's a coward. He won't come out and get her. It's raining. <laughs> Disgraces himself. He has the, to use his belt on the bell because it's like causing sparks. Very and, courageous. Uh, this thing. is one of those things. Mark and I talk about this a lot. There's a lot of movies 
don't you dare go back and watch them because you know that movie I don't know how old you were when you saw that movie you were probably like he was thir- 35 years old. <laughs> 35 you know years what I'm saying? old when I saw the movie. like if you had the feelings you weren't that developed as a person yeah. it felt good that it worked you have all these memories about it if you go back and watch this movie it's it's kind of a shit show so just don't go back and watch <laughs> right. it like it Live with the movie that you've created in your mind. That's yeah. how I felt about The Godfather. No rewatchability. I saw it once and I'm like, right. shit. Just let the memory speak Utter for garbage. it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How would they have gotten the horse's head to that bed without waking up Jack Waltz? No, you're right. Bullshit. It doesn't make any sense. What a right. dumpster <laughs> fire of a movie <laughs> that yeah, Godfather exactly. is. <laughs> but you're right. Some films just don't have... Some movie you can watch 50 times and you're like, this is... Yes. Bro- Midnight Cowboy... I never loses anything for me. I yeah. watch that. That's a masterpiece. And then you watch something else two years later. You're like, oh, God, what shit. What Have I ever I enjoyed thinking? this? Mark you know, and I talk about the Titanic. We cried our balls off in the Titanic. Yep. And then we started to realize, like, even pretty soon after, like, this is not an empirically good movie. No, <laughs> no it's not. It's, it's quite laughable. <laughs> no, yeah, it, it is terrible. Just, but yeah. the subjective experience we had in that movie theater is undeniable. And I, I think we were like both going through breakups at the time, and there was like, of it was like there was like a perfect storm. Well, yeah, I, I think I was nineteen when it came out, and I. I fancied myself a, a young man at the bow of a ship heading into my destiny. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I really dug in on that. I wanted to draw naked girls too. What, what lost you when you rewatched it? When you rewatched Everything. it, what, like what part did you go like, oh, this is douchey? <laughs> I mean, it was just it was it was like a growing dumpster fire. I mean, it was like you you're watching it and you're like, oh my god, not that. Oh, not that. Not that. I think, and the truth is, I think I could I could rewatch it in my mind and know. That right. it was bad. I didn't even have to actually yeah, put my eyeballs on it. Really, yeah. <laughs> I can't. I, I couldn't have really been emotionally attached to this yeah. in any way, yes. shape, or form. Yes. Yep. I watched for the first time in like years. Clue. I watched and I Clue said, too. Thank God, this completely holds up. It's incredible. I, I love watched, it. It's I watched brilliant. it with my kids. Is it and good? They loved it. Really? No way. Yeah. It's incredible. Clue. Yeah, it's really fun. I think it only gets better. To tell you the truth, I don't remember it. I know I've it's seen amazing. it. And I, I have no memory. It's of amazing. So, well, they were, they yeah. did that very unique thing where they made three different endings and put it out into theaters, and yeah. you never knew which one you were going to get. Yeah, which was awesome. That's a great. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. I I like better that I can just watch it and see all three endings now. Yeah. I feel like yes. I'd be frustrated. I'm like, I'm going to see it again. I, yeah, same ending. Oh, you wouldn't same. know which version they were showing or anything. No, mm-hmm. you weren't able to control it. Yeah. No, because if you knew, you would know what the ending was. That's a good point. So they couldn't they couldn't tell you. Did you guys do the creep movies together, or is that just you doing that. No, that was mostly a collaboration I did with uh, my friend Patrick Bryce and and Blumhouse and and you'll kind of see in our in our book that we wrote this book like brothers that came out yesterday you know that book oh, whole thing that whole thing um, you mean the one that your face is oh, on the that cover one of. Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. of it wow. oh, look at that. um, that's been sort of like a, a celebration of like us realizing that we have climbed this mountain together arm in arm codependently mm-hmm. and now. We're realizing that a little bit of creative space and us having affairs on our own creative marriage with right. other people has been bittersweet, but also very healthy for us. Do so you get jealous at all of each other doing something? Oh, yeah. percent. Absolutely <laughs> fucking terrified. hundred yeah. percent. There so, is a chapter in the book called I Am Jealous, in fact. <laughs> and then what? a follow-up chapter called I Am Also Jealous. <laughs> so when you see, like, Creep 2... Has I just checked it last night? It has one hundred percent Rotten Tomato rating. Yeah. Do you go like what, what? What the fuck? You're not supposed to be making movies that are that good. When well, uh, and by the way, horror sequels right yeah. should never should it not happen. Have the only reason you do that is for money, not Rotten Tomatoes. Right. Yeah. I think the right way to talk about it is that I'm super happy for my brother to <laughs> have these experiences and ha- and have fun and and get praised for for these things but i don't want him to be praised too much right because i don't want him to leave me in the dust you don't want him to feel like he doesn't need you yes it's like, this is like ike and tina you don't that's, want that's, you that's absolutely. how i feel about transparent i was just like so happy for my brother to explore acting and do that and it's so great and go off and have new relationships but don't go too far yeah uh and and have a great time and 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 be celebrated, but don't be celebrated too much. So is, is Creep the response to his success in Transparent? I think Creep and Transparent are really kindred spirits as yeah. pieces of art, aren't <laughs> yeah, they? I really? think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I absolutely see, yeah. see the relation there. Yeah. You say it's a Creep, you want to do a trilogy with that, right? Yes, we're working on the third right now. I feel like if I had figured out a concept like that that's like, you know, you can do for a super low budget, no casting, like you can just do it kind of yourself, 
I feel like I'd be like, why don't we make fifty of these? We talk, like, what we, if we just did this? We do. We do talk about that sometime. We do. I do wonder what I will look like uh, as a seventy-year-old man doing Creep '94. <laughs> um, so we'll have to talk about that. But uh, yeah, I, I, I feel you. You yeah. guys passed up a Marvel movie, which a lot of people wouldn't do. Because you said it was going to take you three years and you would be out of the loop where you want to be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've, we like when we came up, you know, we were lucky enough to be in that position where the big studio projects um, were looking at young indie directors because they could get them for cheap. And they were particularly looking for people that actors wanted to work with were kind of known as actors, directors, and, and people who are really, really nice and willing to suffer. Because <laughs> when you're doing a massive movie like that, it's so difficult to get all the movie stars and all the voices and get, and you just end up getting destroyed. Yeah, yeah. Your and, job is to get the movie from A to Z. It's not really to make the best movie. Yeah. it's just to like get through it. Get the things done. So we yes. get a lot of stuff across our desk on that front, and we have for the last honestly, you know, five years or so. And and our our take on it is we're not like hoity toity like oh we're too good to make comic book movies because we make emotional movies like. It's really not that. It's just that Jay and I make so many things. And if you're going to direct a big budget movie, you have to give it your unilateral focus for three years straight. And you also have to make sure it makes its money back. Right. You should. And we're we're bad at both of those things. Is it might a... not be as fun as the, what you're doing now. No, yeah. oh, no it's way. Definitely we would not be as fun. miserable. No. And we have this tiny little corner of the sandbox and and the you know, the most money. One of our movies has ever made is $10 million at the worldwide box office. Uh -huh. Like, But we still get to do what we want to do, and we don't want to mess that up. Is there any anxiety when you first, because like in the grand scheme of things, of course that's the right thing to do. But when you first make the call, like to say, no, I'm not going to yeah. do that. It is hard to do it. Yeah. it and we it's have to have to that no. discussion. Are we really saying no? And we even had like... At a certain point in our careers, what you know, we consider to be one of the top three producers in the world, literally say to us, this was earlier on, why don't you guys want to be millionaires? Yeah. Like seriously, like you don't want to like, it. what's wrong yeah, with like, you? Like we're yeah. actively trying to avoid being rich. Um, <laughs> he literally said it on the phone and I was just like, oh. Boom. Yeah. And you maybe, have to think about it. Maybe yeah. he's right. Maybe he's right. Do you think you would lose something if you had that? Because there are times that people think if things are too good, I'm going to lose this drive that makes nah. me do stuff. You know, you, nah. you'd be comfortable we with are, money. We are. Yeah. Our engine has been running with that desperation drive in full gear. We would <laughs> like <laughs> to reduce the level of pathetic desperation. Oh, you would. Okay. Oh, yeah. We, we would like to. I'll we, tell you, the, the money grab is here, and it's called Like Brothers. Yes. It's in bookstores now. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well done. <laughs>